for having me. So we're going to get going. So welcome to the Mystic and the Skeptic. On today's show, we are honored to have a special guest, the Green Party candidate for president, Mr. Howie Hawkins. And there's a lot of stuff going on, and we want to uh, really get to know you and see what does the Green Party have to offer. So let's start with a little bit about your background and how did you get involved with being the nominee? Uh, well, I'm the nominee because a bunch of people asked me to. Wasn't what I was planning to do. I'm a retired Teamster and uh, worked in warehouses and construction sites my whole life. But I've really been an activist since the 1960s. Civil rights, anti-Vietnam War, the early ecology movement coming up in the San Francisco Bay Area where there was a lot of activity. And concluded at that time that we need another party because the other parties were dragging their feet on civil rights and both supported the escalation in Vietnam. And then in 1984, the Green Party had a national organizing meeting to which I was invited. And I've stayed involved ever since. The Green Party in New York ran me three times for governor each time we got enough votes to get on the ballot. And uh, maybe that's why Greens around the country said, yeah, Howie, you should run. So there was a draft Howie movement and here I am. So uh, <clears throat> when people say, um, is it a feasible plan to get the Green Party to be a contender? How would you respond to that if uh, after all these years, it's hard to, to get traction? And until I started researching what the Green Party had to offer this time around, I wasn't really aware of who was running. Uh, are we having a, an issue getting marketing and information out? Or is it that is part of the problem that the two big parties are suppressing uh, third party? Well, they definitely are. Uh, you know, the, the Democratic Party, you know, knocked us off the ballot in three states. They've tripled the number of votes we need to keep our ballot line here in my state of New York. And they don't want the competition. And they've made it really hard to get on the ballot in this country, much harder than other countries. You want to run for Congress in the United States, in most states, it takes thousands of signatures or tens of thousands of signatures to run as an independent without a ballot line. You want to do that in the United Kingdom to run for the House of Commons, it takes 10 signatures. You want to run for Congress in India, the biggest electoral democracy in the world, it takes two signatures. It takes two signatures in New Zealand, 50 in Australia, 100 in Canada. And here it takes thousands or tens of thousands. So that's one obstacle. An even bigger obstacle is that the corporate state media, the big networks, these big media conglomerates, are stenographers for the two-party corporate state. So for example, if you look at public opinion polls, what the Green Party is advocating is what the majority of Americans want. We're for Medicare for all. Biden and Trump are not. We're for a Green New Deal. Biden and Trump are not. We're for cutting our bloated military budget and getting out of these endless wars and, and stop deploying these new nuclear weapons, which have destabilized the you know, nuclear balance of power. We're for that, Biden and Trump are not. And the people are with us on those things. So it's a real uh, commentary on our political system that what the people want doesn't get translated into public policy. Tell us about the successes you had in New York. Um, how, how did you go about pushing the no fracking uh, legislation? And when people say, well, nobody wants to follow an independent, nobody wants to follow the Greens because they can't win. Uh, tell us how you were able to win that fight for the environment in your state. Well, it took a movement. Um, when I ran for governor in 2010, we were calling for a ban on fracking when most of the environmental movement was saying natural gas is the bridge to the renewable future. And we later learned the oil and gas industry had paid $26 million to the Sierra Club, whose Beyond Coal campaign had that perspective. Other environmentalists were saying, well, let's study it because it might harm the water. And we were saying, yeah, it might harm the water, but it's definitely going to harm the planet. We don't need to study that. We know it's going to happen. And we got traction. And after that campaign, uh, you know, some wealthy liberals 
started funding nonprofits to call for a ban on fracking, our demand. You know, uh, Steyer out there on the West Coast uh, put some money into a group here. So we hounded uh, Andrew Cuomo, the governor, for four years. But I think what sealed the deal was we ran again in 2014, and I got 5% of the vote. And that was the year Andrew Cuomo wanted to run up the vote to run for president. He wanted to get more votes than his father, Mario Cuomo, ever got as governor. He wanted to get more votes than when he was first elected in 2010, and he got less. He couldn't take our 5% of the electorate for granted. And so after that election, he adopted the ban on fracking, which he had never supported. He adopted a $15 minimum wage and paid family leave in extension of the millionaire's tax. Policies he didn't support running for governor. So we don't have to win the office to have political leverage. But I think the way we're gonna to get to the point, I mean, our goal is certainly to have influence, but we wanna replace the two major parties. We wanna be a major party. And I think we need to do what the Republican party did 150 years ago, and that was they elected people to local office and then Congress. And when Lincoln ran, he was not a third party candidate. He was the candidate of the Republicans who had the plurality of members of Congress after the 1958 election. So we got to build this from the bottom up, elect thousands of people to local office and from there, state legislatures and Congress. And then when we run a presidential ticket, they won't be able to ignore us. What do you think about the incrementalism that some people are pushing for? And even Bernie Sanders, who at first seemed like he was going to be an independent who was going to push the Democratic Party to be more green, more pro uh, the needs of the people. And then a lot of people are, are worried that he's kind of sold out by making a, a alliances with people who are not interested in bringing about change, but just saying the right things to get progressives to vote for them. Well, I think Bernie Sanders is a, is a case study of how people go into the Democratic Party to change it, and they get changed by it. His signature issue was Medicare for All. And a few months ago, he went on MSNBC and said, I'm willing to compromise with Biden. We'll have Medicare for everybody 55 and up, which leaves in place these hundreds of private insurance companies. And for providers to get paid, they got to figure out does which plan the patient is covered by, is the treatment or service that they're providing get covered by the plan, and then will it, how much will the plan pay, and then they haggle over the price. And that bureaucracy, that whole process, adds about 30% to the cost of healthcare. The whole point of Medicare for All, or one of the major points, was that it's efficient. You have a single public payer pay for all medically necessary services. And Sanders abandoned that. Now, before he decided to run as a Democrat, and got, he got the, the corporate establishment in the Democratic Party just closed that path to him. I mean, that was very clear when all the other candidates lined up behind Biden in this, this round. But before that, when he was running as an independent for mayor of Burlington, Vermont, for Congress member from Vermont and then senator, he won election after election running as an independent. So I think the lesson of Bernie Sanders is run as an independent if you're a progressive. You can win and you won't get caught in that quagmire of the Democratic Party where you have to compromise to be part of it. You know, Bernie had to pledge when he first ran in 2015 that he would support the Democratic nominee, which everybody, probably including him, assumed would be Clinton. And he wanted to raise some issues. But to do that, he had to pledge to support the nominee in order to get into debates and on the Democratic Party ballots. So from the very start, he, he was compromising. And that's uh, what happens when you go in a Democratic Party. The left needs to speak for its own platform directly to the people in elections under its own banner and not confuse people with the corporate Democratic Party. I think the progressives, the corporate power structure in the Democratic Party likes the progressives to make speeches and draw in progressive voters. But when it comes to making the policy decisions, it's the corporate wing that makes the decisions and has the power. Well, let's say that we get a green um, 
I don't know if there are any green uh, congressmen or women or senators. Um, wouldn't they be shut down automatically by the corporate interests and the corporate um, candidates from both parties? Well, certainly the corporate parties would oppose them, but they'll have a platform. They'll be a member of Congress. That's a better platform than being a candidate for Congress. You've been elected by the people and that will encourage other people to run. And it will tell particularly the progressive Democrats, if they don't get on board the full green program and stop compromising with the Pelosi's and Schumer's of, of their party, they're gonna get replaced by a green. And I think you can extend that into the so-called purple districts and even the conservative districts. I mean, when you get beyond the labels and talk to people about concrete solutions, Medicare for all, even the majority of Republicans support that. Uh, and you get to the climate issue, you know, when they polled about the Green New Deal in late uh, 2018, after it got a lot of attention after that sit in in Pelosi's office by the Sunrise Movement, over 80% of the American people wanted it, including 64% of Republicans. So I think we can be competitive everywhere by presenting our program and running, you know, grassroots campaigns. We're not going to get the big corporate money, but we can raise enough money from a mass base of supporters, and Bernie Sanders showed that, to be competitive in the, uh, you know, what you need money for, hiring staff, advertising, and so forth. We won't have the big, as big of money as the major party corporate back candidates, but we'll have enough to compete. Tell me about this branding problem. Um, you know, people assume that socialism has something to do with the Nazis, the, the Cubans, the Venezuelans, all these groups that are maligned in America. So the moment you say, well, I have a vice presidential candidate who is part of the Socialist Party, or we're using a socialist system to bring about health care or jobs or something like that, is there a way to use a different uh, term or define it in a way that it is more inviting? Because America seems to be very reactionary and anything that is foreign or weird or out of the ordinary, there's an automatic backlash. And I felt that that happened to Bernie from the get-go uh, by defining himself as a democratic socialist. He pretty much cut the legs under himself. What do you think? Well, I think he helped open up the discussion. Socialism used to be a conversation stopper right across the board. Now it's a conversation starter for a lot of people. So that's good. I, I think socialism uh, refers to we need system change. Socialism is about economic democracy. And it's really very American. The first workers party in the world was organized in Philadelphia and New York in 1829, the Working Men's Party. And even earlier than that, uh, in the transition from uh, John Quincy Adams and uh, it wasn't Jackson, it was the one before that. Anyway, they had Robert Owen speak to joint sessions of Congress, the Supreme Court, and the presidency about socialism. So that's early industrialism and, and people recognized there were problems with these large scale enterprises, which meant that the traditional, before that American idea that you know, you start out as an apprentice, and then you're a journeyman, and then you're a master artisan, and you have your own business. That path was closed when everybody was put into factories. So cooperative production became uh, the alternative to that. So, and we had a long tradition going right through the Socialist Party of Eugene Debs and Norman Thomas in the early 1930s. And then the Socialist Movement went into the Democratic Party. And is really just now starting to come out or at least come out as an alternative uh, perspective. So I think that's the first thing to recognize. It's very American, it's not foreign. Uh, secondly, it's about democracy, economic democracy. And we can't have real political democracy without economic democracy because if you have a billionaire class which capitalism creates, their concentrated economic power translates into concentrated political power. That's why even the majority of people who want a Medicare for all, for example, it doesn't get translated into policy because not only can they, you know, pay for the campaigns of corporate candidates and for lobbyists, but their investment decisions can undermine 
uh, government reforms. So they'll still have the power to resist and roll back the programs. I mean, Bernie Sanders called himself a socialist, but he was really an old fashioned New Deal liberal. Tax the billionaires to fund some social programs. The problem is the billionaires still got that economic power, translates into political power, and then they resist and roll back those social programs. So I think we need, you know, real political democracy needs socialism or economic democracy. I think that's the way we need to frame it. So when you go to uh, vote for a primary, they ask you, are you a Republican or a Democrat? And even uh, as we were asking for a mail-in ballot that asked us, are we a, Demo a Republican or a Democrat? Why are they not even giving you a chance to say you're an independent? Is that part of the, the blockage? Like they're already making you side with one of the two major parties and dismiss all the other groups? Are you telling me they asked your party for a general election uh, ballot? They did in Texas. In Texas. Mm -hmm. I got to investigate that because that's very problematic. The Green Party's on the ballot in Texas. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we parties should not be controlled by the state. You should not have the state, uh, you know, registering in the, in the registering who's in a party, or when you go to a primary in an open state, you ask for the ballot of a party. Um, parties should be private organizations where people agree to the principles and support it with dues or contributions. Um, but what we have in this country is a two-party state where the, they're administered, the elections are administered by the two governing parties. I mean, what other country does that? You know, maybe Russia, maybe China, the Communist Party there. Most democracies have an independent nonpartisan commission administering elections. And we ran into this problem trying to get on the ballot. It was partisan votes and election boards, election commissions, and in the courts of whether or not we should be on the ballot. That is not the way, you know, an independent fair election should be run. It should be run by an agency that is nonpartisan, independent of the election competition. So tell me about, about these lawsuits that happened. Was it that you didn't get enough votes before the, the original ballots were mailed or what happened in these three states? Were they trying well, to the states are Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Montana. And in every case, we got between two and three times the number of signatures required. In the case of Pennsylvania, uh, we petitioned with favorite daughters standing in until we had our national convention to substitute the national nominees. And one of the favorite daughters mailed her form in instead of attaching it to the petition. So I got to the election commission or the board of election or whatever they call it in Pennsylvania. And the Democrats objected that that wasn't kosher. And maybe technically it wasn't, but what's needed is the address of the candidate and the fact that they're running and that the stand-in was removing themselves. And they had that information. The Democrats also objected. We turned in nearly 10,000 signatures. They objected to over 5,000 of them. So we had to spend a month and a lot of money with the help of lawyers or you know, to have the help of lawyers to document that our signatures were good. Then the Democrats dropped that objection because they knew they wouldn't win that. And they got us knocked off on this narrow technicality. And in the courts, it was strictly partisan. At a lower court, it was a Republican majority. They put us on a ballot. When it got to the Supreme Court, Democratic majority, and they knocked us off the ballot. In Pennsylvania, I mean, in Wisconsin, we did everything we were told. We had three times the number of signatures we needed. And they objected that my running mate, Angela Walker, had moved during the petitioning period, you know, four miles within her hometown of Florence, South Carolina. And so they said the petitions gathered when she was at her old address were no longer valid, which is ridiculous. It's not in the law of Wisconsin. And when we had a hearing, there was a Democrat presiding over the election commission. She would not let us present our documentation. They broke the law right there. And then they, uh, we had to go to the uh, Supreme Court of Wisconsin and they held on to the case for 10 days. And then they said, we're too late because they have to mail out absentee ballots in two days. The dissenting opinion said, by the facts and the law, we should be on the ballot. 
And in fact, the election commission broke the law. Then you go to Montana and there were two and a half times the number of signatures collected. You have to collect them in a certain number in each house district. So the Democrats went, went to one of those house districts and started bullying people to withdraw their signature. Now their signature was a signed, dated witness document. It's like an affidavit. They withdrew by emails and phone calls to the Democratic Secretary of State. There's not even a provision for that in Montana election law. And the same thing happened in the courts. By the time it got to the top court, it was a Democratic majority that kicked us off the ballot. That's what I mean. You've got partisan administration of elections and it's not fair, you know, because we were qualified for the ballot in all three of those states. Tell us about your worries. Um, I know that um, the Republicans try to minimize the issues that are happening right now with the Trump administration. And then the Democrats, sometimes they don't even talk about the issues because they've supported a lot of them. So what, if things have gotten bad in the last four years, what do we have coming our way with um, Biden or a Trump administration that is gonna make it even harder for us to survive and for us to be able to um, live out our, our democratic rights in this country? Well, I think it's gonna be a Biden administration. All we gotta do is make sure those mail-in ballots are counted. The polls have been consistent since Biden became the presumptive nominee. And he's actually been growing his lead from starting at 4% then to 7, 8%. And since that disastrous debate for Trump, it's double digits. And the same thing in the, the old battleground states in the upper Midwest are now solidly Biden. The new battleground states are formerly solidly Republican states like Georgia and Texas and Arizona. So I think, you know, a second Trump uh, term would be a disaster. And, you know, that'd be nothing but resistance for us. I think we're going to be facing a Biden administration. And I think progressives are very soon going to be disappointed because he's, he's a not just a corporate Democrat, he's got a long history of being a conservative corporate Democrat on corporate issues, you know, credit card industry, criminal justice issues, the crime bill in 1994, foreign policy. I mean, he was the big cheerleader for the Democrats getting into that Iraq invasion. Uh, he wants to overthrow the government of Venezuela, just like Trump does. There's no distance between them there. Um, so I think the prospects are the, end, the left needs to declare its independence and stop trying to influence the corporate Democrats. And the more people vote for Biden, the stronger his mandate is, the more he's going to ignore the progressive side. He's going to think he's got them in their hip pocket. That's why we argue the strongest anti-Trump vote and the strongest vote for a progressive agenda is the green vote in this election. And what we about need that vote to to get our ballot lines, to retain our ballot lines in about 40 to 50 states. We need 1%, 2%, 3%, 5%. It depends on the state. But those ballot lines are important because if we don't have them, it's, a lot, it's really hard to get on a ballot. The reason I contacted you guys is because I was shamed by a, a blue dog Democrat for voting for Jill Stein last time. And I voted for Jill Stein in Tennessee where it was already a Republican state that went for Trump anyway. And even th that is bad. And then they went back in time and they're like, because of people like you, Al Gore didn't win and this and that. So they don't even understand how voting works. And then they always want to dismiss you and shame you. What, what's, what's, how can we combat that type of ignorance and that type of um, misunderstanding of the system and how we can make it better? Well, first of all, whether you talk about Jill Stein in 2016 or Ralph Nader in 2000, it was not the green vote that made the difference. Jill Stein exit polls showed that 61% of her voters would not have come out and voted if she was not on the ballot. You plug that number into the closest state, Michigan, still wouldn't have changed things. But even before, you know, in the, in the margins, you know, the greens might be the margin of difference in some election. But before you even get there, you've got black voter suppression. Big issue in Florida in 2000. Over 100,000 black voters were wrongly purged from the rolls because they were allegedly felons. And then you had the hanging chads, which were disproportionately in some counties that had a high black populations. 
their votes weren't counted. And most blacks, it was like 93% of black voters in Florida were voting for Gore. So if you wanna stop the Republicans, stop black voter suppression. And then the Electoral College, Bush and then Trump were the losers. They lost the popular vote. So rather than try to keep the Greens out of the election, why don't you get the, you know, solve the real problem? The Electoral College. And we've been telling them for 20 years, it's a proven nonpartisan solution. Replace the Electoral College with a national popular vote using ranked choice voting, where you rank your choices one, two, three. And so if you're a progressive, you can vote for the Hawkins Walker ticket, rank that first, and then put Biden Harris second. You won't be helping Trump in any way. That's a solution. And the Democrats have had two decades to embrace that. And instead, they scapegoat the Green Party or Russia or somebody else, but you know, their own failure to deal with the real problem, which is the suppression of black voters and other democratic constituencies by the Republicans and the Electoral College. So we say, let's solve the problem. And because you're not helping solve the problem, maybe it's you Democrats who are, who are spoiling this election. In the last few minutes, can you give us your pitch? Like if you were part of one of the debates, what would be your final pitch for people to vote for you specifically? The Green Party represents what you want, what the majority of people want. We're for a Green New Deal, Trump and Biden are not. We're for Medicare for all, Trump and Biden are not. We're for cutting back the bloated military budget and putting those resources into caring for the people in the planet. Trump and Biden are not. So it's better to vote for what you want, you may not get it, but at least tell the politicians, tell the public where you stand then to get lost in the sauce. If you're a progressive and you vote for Biden, they don't know you want Medicare for all. They don't know you want a Green New Deal. You basically voted for Biden who's opposed to those things. So don't lose your voice. Don't lose your power. Vote for what you want and make the politicians come to you. And what about getting him elected and then pushing him to do the right thing? Has that ever worked? Uh, well, demonstrations, uh, they raise issues, but they don't put pressure unless there's a political alternative on the ballot. If there's no threat of taking their votes, they don't feel any threat. They don't feel you got any power, so they can ignore you. I mean, we saw that in the buildup to the Iraq war. You know, they called us the second, world's second superpower. That's what the New York Times called us, these massive demonstrations. And the Democrats still lined up with Bush for that invasion. And by the time we got to 2004, you know, Kerry didn't feel pressure from an independent left. So he said, I can fight the war better than Bush can. Remember reporting for duty when he accepted the Democratic nomination? He wanted a surge bigger than Bush got. And because so much of the peace movement and progressives lined up behind Kerry because Bush seemed so bad, the anti-war movement, you know, basically decapitated itself. You know, we're better putting forward our demands independently. Like during the Vietnam, the anti-Vietnam War movement, our slogan was out now. And we put that on Humphrey as well as Nixon. We didn't say Humphrey's the lesser evil. And even in the primary, we put that on McCarthy and Kennedy, out now. They were the so-called uh, anti-war candidates, but they were saying for negotiations now. And we were saying, there's nothing to negotiate. We have no business being in Vietnam, out now. And that movement, uh, you know, made it clear and we mobilized the majority. And by the time Nixon and Kissinger wanted to execute their secret plan to end the war, which was tactical nukes in North Vietnam, we had the massive uh, Vietnam War moratorium in October 1970. And then the, uh, the big demonstrations the next month, exactly a month later. And Nixon and Kissinger concluded Nixon couldn't win re-election if they went ahead with their secret plan. And they actually feared a revolution. Now I was in the movement. I don't think we were that much of a threat to them, but we were a power. So I think that's an example where if we don't, you know, settle for the lesser evil, but make our demands on everybody, we can make better progress than if we compromise before 
you know, and it basically takes our power from us. Do you have a couple more minutes? I have one last question, if possible. Sure, sure. What is your position on immigration? Uh, there's been a lot of talk about um, an amnesty or even Democrats, um, you know, like Obama deported a bunch of people and they're saying, well, they only deported criminals, but now some of his policies are causing a lot of uh, pain and suffering for families. So what would be a green version of, of what to do with the immigrant community? Well, day one, we would uh, release people detained who are seeking immigration or asylum. We would reunite families. We provide services to these people so they can get settled and go through the process for immigration or asylum. That would be the immediate steps. We would give documents to everybody so they wouldn't be second class residents and they could take advantage of social services, which is a public health issue, particularly now in this COVID pandemic. And that would be what we do immediately. In the longer run, we want open borders like they have within the European Union or with the Andean countries in Latin America or the four Central American countries where you check in at the border. If there's not a warrant out for your arrest, you go about your business, vacation, shopping, work, or residence. And, you know, it'd be work both ways. And uh, freedom of movement is a basic human right. It's part of the Declaration of Human Rights from 1948. At that time, it was directed within countries that had internal passport systems like apartheid South Africa and Russia and China. But now in a global economy, uh, there is no internal you know, system. It's freedom of movement should apply to working people as well as capital. So that's the direction we'd like to move in. And, and do you feel that the current immigration laws are racist since they have a cap on people from Mexico, China, India, and the Philippines? Yeah, by definition, it's real clear. And it, you know, the, the targeting of people from Muslim countries is, uh, it's certainly religious bias and it's ethnic too, it's racist. Well, we want to thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure having you on the show, and I hope that uh, you get um, your message out. I, I feel that it's kind of late in the game, but if we can get people to, to know your platform and support what you guys are doing, uh, we can make some lasting impact. Well, thank you, and uh, it doesn't stop on November 3rd. We'll keep going. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Take care.